It's my privilege to be with you this morning. Uh, I know to most of you I'm a complete stranger, uh, but to your pastor and his wife, um, I was afforded the privilege of being their pastor back when they were, let's just say, much younger. Uh, I pastored Village Meadows Baptist Church in Sierra Vista for 25 years, and, and they were in the early part of that experience, and I got to watch Ed grow in the Lord and call to ministry. was. Uh, able to be uh, uh, present to lay hands on him as ordination over in Elfrida, and then of course the rest is history, and the Lord brought them here. And he called me, invited me to fill his pulpit, and <clears throat> I quite honestly was uh, uh, very honored. So it is my honor to be with you this morning. Let me begin by sharing with you what I'll call a telling story that was circling around the internet, which of course m means it's true. <laughs> Uh, a story about an interesting arrest. It tells of a man driving cautiously who decides to stop at a traffic light when the light turned yellow instead of speeding up through a red light. Some of you think the yellow light means speed up, but he didn't, okay? And so happened there was this very impatient woman behind him who came to a screeching halt, hoping she could make the light, but he stopped, and, and she was just, well, should we say ticked off. She missed her chance. Apparently she had to get somewhere quickly. Now she expressed herself to him and with body language and verbiage, uh, not just immediately, but she just kept on ranting and raving until she heard a tap on her window and turned to look into the face of a very serious police officer. The officer ordered her to exit her her car showing her hands and she got out. He handcuffed her, he took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a holding cell. Well, after a couple of hours, a policeman came and escorted her back to the, to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. He said to her, I'm very sorry for the mistake. You see, I pulled up behind you while you were blowing your horn, flipping off the guy in front of you and cursing a blue streak. When I noticed the choose life license plate holder, the what would Jesus do and follow me to Sunday school bumper stickers with a chrome plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk. Well, naturally, I assumed you had stolen the car. <laughs> now, I share that with you because I, we can relate to that, hopefully not too closely, but we relate to the idea that there are times when we don't really show Christ like we should, that the circumstance uh, warps us in such a way that we lose our cool. Now don't you wish you could never fail to honor God? That would be a nice thing, and that should be what we're striving for as followers of Jesus Christ, to honor God in every circumstance, in every situation, that our thoughts are His thoughts, and therefore our reactions are His reactions. Well, we can only hope to come close to this norm by being consistent in our walk with Jesus Christ, a walk that is only fortified by our commitment to the Word of God. A commitment to the Word of God takes us beyond the mere lip service, but allows the counsel of God to enter our heart and guide us, even when we slam on the brakes behind a guy who's very cautious. Well, with this in mind, I, I want us to look at a single verse that directly addresses the matter of how to think to the glory of God, or if you please, how to think just like Jesus. That verse is Philippians 4.8, and if you have your scripture with you, uh, whether uh, printed or digital, if you want to be turning there, although there will be screenshots for you to see. But I just want you to know that uh, the book of Philippians is one of Paul's, if not his warmest book. It's warm because he's not dealing in this particular book with so much with heresy and rebellion and complacency, but rather fondness and gratefulness. He does address one conflict, asking the church family to help two women who were arguing over something. He never says what it is. But even then, he comments about them and their service to the Lord how they worked faithfully for the sake of the gospel. Like I say, it's a warm-hearted epistle or letter. And this letter instructs us how to think to the glory of God. 
With that in mind, let's take a look at this verse. And as you know, we're chapter 4, which is the last part of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the letter. And so Paul, Paul is winding it up. He's beginning to conclude his letter. And so he begins by saying, finally. Okay. Keep in mind everything I've just written to you. Now, finally, frame all I've written to you with these words. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. And there's the key words for us this morning. Dwell on these things. Now, Paul's instructions to dwell on these things is directly tied back to something he had said earlier in his letter about the humility that Jesus exhibited. In fact, in verse, chapter 3, verse 6, he says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Uh, other translations say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Or your attitude should be the same as Christ. So we're talking about how we think. Think just like Jesus. Now, we can add to this what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, I'm sharing these particular passages with you to, uh, to, to contribute to what it means to dwell to dwell on these particular six things that Paul's addressing here. But I have to say, and I anticipated this because I was experiencing too, when you read this, you have to be warned about something. You, you want to say to yourself, yeah, but. I call it the yeah, but. Yeah, but. Yes, Lord, you're telling me to dwell, to focus, to concentrate on whatever is true, whatever is honorable, just, pure, lovely, and commendable. But what about all the CRAP going on in our world, you know? Not to mention that person who drives me crazy. You may dwell on these things, all this other stuff is happening. Dwell on these things, but what about all the lies and all the dishonorable, unjust, impure, ugly, and despicable things confronting us in this world? Now, while all those unrighteous things are happening in our world, God is not telling us to pretend they don't exist. He's instructing us not to focus or dwell on them. Rather, dwell on whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, and commendable. That's the instruction of God in His Word today. Yes, all these things are happening, but don't dwell on them. Dwell on this. Dwell on this. Now, why is this? Well, Paul basically tells us why. And, and it's in the previous verses. Uh, look with me back at verses 4 through 7, just leading up to what we're reading here this morning. Uh, and by the way, this is a passage that some have, have called the antidote to falling apart. It reads, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Uh, Tony, I probably should have queued this up and said, we, we could sing that one. You know? Anyway, rejoice in the Lord always. I, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You ever read that in the midst of a conflict and go, yeah, but. Hmm. You see, God is inspiring by His Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul, to write these words for these Philippian believers and for us today, right now. And through Paul, God wants us, the people of God, to have the peace of God. That's the point. Paul wants the people of God to have the peace of God. Now, that's only achieved when we concentrate or focus or dwell on that which is righteous, on that which is praiseworthy. That's how it happens. But we have to decide to do this. These are instructions that can only be followed when we say, okay, I'll do just that. 
Now, when we look at this text, we can take on a global perspective and apply the text to what's going on globally. But I want to move it to its greater relevance and more particularly its context. Its context is the local church. Paul's writing to the believers in Philippi, those who make up those house churches throughout the community of Philippi. Uh, Believers who are striving to live out their faith in fellowship with one another. Now, for us to be the family of believers uh, that can relate to this, I'll just address you here and now. This letter is written to First Southern Baptist Church of Tucson, written to you. And and to understand this verse as God would have us understand it, and, and to make it personal, I want you to focus on your relationships in this church, okay? Because that's where this is taking us. As we're about to see, these six things are instructed to concentrate on relationships, not situations. Uh, The English language sometimes misleads us a little bit, and the translation from the Greek is very helpful, particularly in this case. Because the specific Greek words that Paul uses here with these six adjectives is, is directed much more towards relationships to behavior than it is to some general idea about whatever around the world is, you know, just and pure and so forth and so on. So it's about relationships within the family of faith. And, and the word, by the way, whatever, for those of you who like this sort of thing, it's in its plural form, which means it has several attributes that can be considered. Well, what, what, what this all means is Paul's instructing us to think more about people than about circumstances okay, or situations, about people. Uh, That's why I've given this message the title, Thinking Just Like Jesus, because that's Paul's target. Think just like Jesus. Now, God understands our thoughts. He understands, and we should too, that our thoughts give birth to our behavior. And our behavior gives birth to our testimony. I mean, this is to say the lady in that car lost her testimony. <laughs> so I have to ask you, and, and don't, don't, don't have to respond out loud, but in your heart, I need to ask you, and you can be honest with yourself because nobody's listening in except God. <laughs> Do you want to think like Jesus? If you really want to think like Jesus, first you must make certain you have given him your life. Okay? You have to have received Him. The Bible tells us that, that we receive Christ when we ask Him, because He's the only one who can, ask Him to forgive us of our sins. When we ask Him to forgive us our sins, and then we also believe in that, in that confession and that repentance that God raised Him from the dead. And then we invite Him into our life to take over. Because, ladies and gentlemen, Until you have Christ in you, you will not have His power within you. And let me just help you save yourself a lot of anxiety. You will never be able to think like Jesus unless you have the power of Christ in you. Therefore, He must be in you by His Spirit. And so we must be, as Jesus calls it, be born again, receive Him into our life. And then when He's living in us by His Holy Spirit, we'll have that presence and that power to then think like Him. Okay? So thinking just like Jesus. Let's look at each one of these words and unpack it just a little bit. Whatever is true. Whatever is true. Now, while we may think Paul's talking about what is true over against what is false, that's really not the issue here. Uh, again, the Greek word here for true addresses the matter of truthfulness or dependability. Keeping in mind, he's talking about relationships. The idea is that we stop when we say whatever is true, we're being asked to think of whoever we know who has proven themselves to be trustworthy, to be dependable. He's saying, think about them. Think about them. Now, let's look at this in a practical sense. 
If you're going to give serious thought to what you know to be true, dependable, and trustworthy, are you going to dwell on your car? Are you going to think about your computer or your water heater? I'm not really being facetious here. You're going to think about people, people you've been able to count on when times get tough. You're going to think about that person or those persons who have gone the extra mile with you. Now, I have to ask you, is anybody coming to mind? Somebody that to you has been true. Then we have whatever is honorable. Now, some of you have in your version of the Bible the word honest or noble. The meaning of the word in the Greek incorporates all these ideas, but it can be down to whatever is worthy of respect. Now, all these are very closely tied together, you see, when we talk about people and character. But this is thinking about whoever is worthy of respect. In other words, think about those you know who have inspired you. In particular, other believers who live out loud their Christian faith. I don't mean in an obnoxious way. I mean they're consistent. They love Jesus, and those who know them know they love Jesus. So what do you think of when you dwell on whoever is worthy of your respect? Again, do your thoughts travel to inanimate objects? Of course they don't. Because inanimate objects don't offer you any encouragement. That's Paul's point here. Think about the people you hold in high regard because of their honesty and their honorable way they live their lives. Because when you think about them, whether you see them daily or infrequently, but when you think about them, you're encouraged, you're inspired to follow their example. Again, is anybody coming to mind? If so, Paul's saying, dwell on them. Hmm. It's interesting that in more than one of his letters, Paul invites his readers to look at his life and to follow his example. Now, he's not arrogant. He's a teacher. He's wanting them to learn how to look for and recognize those that are honorable. Now, Paul does this very thing in verse 9. Take a look at that. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. So Paul's not full of himself. Now, his point for others to, is not to look at him as a person, but to look at what Jesus is doing in his life. That's where that goes. So I have to ask you, who in this church is an example of honesty and integrity? Follow their example. In fact, make it your goal to be someone others can look to for this very thing. Whatever is just. Again, he's addressing our relationships. Paul is saying dwell on whatever is just or right regarding your assessment or judgment of someone else. Now, the counsel here is to be totally fair in how you size someone up. Now, this causes us to ask ourselves, how do we judge others? And then don't sit there and think, I never judge anybody. How do we judge others? Hmm. Are we always fair? Let me try to explain how it looks. Let's say you have a close friend who does something to disappoint you. They let you down or they embarrass you. If you let that single incident blanket all the good they have exhibited toward you, then your judgment of them is not going to be fair, is it? Now, when it comes to misjudgments, it also applies to how you see yourself. And we're going to get real personal now. Because some people are so down on themselves, they fail to see their own value and worth. That's here that Satan has a field day capitalizing on what is not true about you. Accusing you of being 
worthless and unredeemable. What is true, what is true is that God loves you so passionately and so deeply, listen carefully, you cannot mess up enough to change his mind about you. Did you hear that? You cannot mess up enough. Now, that's not a license to go out and mess up. But you can't mess it up so much that God knows I'm going to love you. His passion and, and, and desire for you and relationship to you is, is far exceeds anything uh, that we can do. God never makes any mistakes. He didn't make any mistakes in making you. And add to this the profound message of the gospel that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to die for our sins. The sinless one dying for our sins. That makes sense. Understand that Jesus did not go to the cross to die for worthless people. He saw you and hung on the cross, by the way. He died for you and for me. So, whoever you're sizing up, whether it's yourself or, or someone else, make sure you're seeing the whole picture. Your conclusions are more consequential than you might think. Again, the challenge here, and I'm going to ask you, are you thinking of anybody? Anybody coming to mind that you have, in your own confession, misjudged? Whatever is pure. I'm confident all of you have a fairly good idea of the difference between pure and impure thoughts, of what is wholesome and what is not. And so our challenge here is to think pure thoughts, moral and clean thoughts, regarding relationships. Now, the seriousness of this matter is captured by Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We're in Ephesians 5. Verse 1 through 4, he says, Therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. But sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you, as is proper for saints. Obscene and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving thanks. Again, the focus here is on relationships. We're, express our, we're to express our love to one another in ways that reflect the goodness and grace of God. Paul's telling us there's no place for disrespectful and slanderous comments about anyone inside or, for that matter, outside the church. Family of faith. Now, I, I realize there are times when there is a fine line between crude and funny jokes. Okay? I realize that the judgment about which is which is a relative thing. For example, I happen to think blonde jokes are funny, but bald jokes are not. <laughs> <All right. Amen. laughs> whatever is pure, whatever is wholesome, dwell on that. And then he says, whatever is lovely. The root word in the Greek is phileo, from which Philadelphia gets its name. And what is the Name Philadelphia mean city of brotherly love. Now the council here is to think about the people that draw love out of you. They're ones about what you say, I just love them. And when you think of them, you get a warm feeling because they remind you of how blessed you are to have them in your life. Now the idea here comes very close to whatever is honorable statement, but uh, let me just say that, that of these six things, uh, this one shouldn't take a whole lot of effort. It should come rather easily. It's because Paul's encouraging the Philippian brothers and sisters to dwell on those among them who lift them up in love. Now, don't forget the apostle goal here is for us to think like Jesus. What you ha if you haven't figured that out by now, it does wonders for your attitude. It brings you the peace of God. So whatever's lovely. Who, who comes to mind? 
And then lastly, whatever is commendable. Other translations use the words admirable and of good report. Uh, think about whatever is, is non-offensive, about what you would compliment someone on. Uh, let your thoughts rest on the good things someone is doing. Focus on the many righteous deeds people are doing and not the occasional mistakes they make. See the challenge? Jesus' words, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself, as it comes to mind here. So how do you want others to think of you? You want them to think of your attributes, to think about your good qualities? Well, of course you do. Think the same about them. Now, as he draws to the closure of this particular section of his letter, in a form of summation, he essentially says, if any of what I've just said is morally excellent or worth our praise, then camp out on it. To dwell on it doesn't mean to give passing thoughts a couple minutes a week. It means to camp out there. To dwell, to think, to focus on these things. And when the opposite pops in your mind, the temptation to think otherwise, don't give it the time of day. So, I want you to right now think about who you know is trustworthy. Don't think about the flaky people you know. Think about the ones you know that's trustworthy. Think about those you know are honorable. Stop thinking about those who are dishonorable. Think about those who are honorable. Dwell on what is fair, pure, and lovely instead of what is unfair, impure, and unlovely. Think about how you can compliment people instead of criticizing them. In other words, think just like Jesus. Think just like Jesus. Now, I want you to understand that as Paul's writing to these Philippian believers, they are not living in a vacuum, okay? Uh, they're not in some climate that is just benign. There's no real challenges to them, okay? They're living in the real world like we are. They're facing their own type of moral and cultural calamity. Specifically, they're suffering serious persecution from Rome and because they're unwilling to declare Nero as their Lord. And because of that, it's caused them some significant hardship to include public humiliation, loss of jobs, and even imprisonment. Now, I want you to take note that Paul's not rallying them to protest, but rather to dwell on the goodness of God. Again, this is, our world is messed up. God wants us to have the peace in the midst of this messed up world. Even in the midst of our church family. Have peace. Now, let me close by saying I want to challenge you to look at Jesus' life. If you still need convincing this is the right thing to do, just look at Christ's life. And take note of the fact that in the midst of all the evil and wicked things happening to and around him, his thoughts were these good thoughts. Just study his reactions and his actions throughout his public ministry, and in particular his dealing with the 12 disciples, and you'll see how he thinks. We are responsible for our thoughts. And if we allow our thoughts to become Christ-like, what a refreshing and liberating experience we have in store for us, as well as for the church family we're a part of. This is God's aim. So, to think these thoughts defines the habit of thought. 
It's been said, I don't know who said it, but it's been said the sum total of a person is what they think about. Now, only you and God know what you think about. Now, if your thoughts are not what they should be, let God, who knows every thought, give you the power to dwell on the kinds of things that will lift others up and lift you up at the same time. So I want to challenge you. Commit yourself to doing that. And it's really easy to have a closing prayer and say, have a good life. But I don't want us to leave here without having come to grips with whether we're going to do this or not. So there's an invitation time. The invitation is not necessarily to come to this altar, but the invitation is for you to, to talk to God. And, and if confession is necessary, then fess up. Receive his forgiveness and his strength to be able to dwell on these kinds of things. Would you commit to that? Who knows? It might just keep you from being arrested for car theft. You never know. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is by your grace and mercy we appeal to you to come into our midst in a way that, Father, manifests your presence Thankfully that you've been here with us this morning through our praise and worship and now through the proclamation of your word. But, Father, we're asking for an even greater manifestation of us changing our minds about bad thinking. And so, Father, as this invitation is giving, I, I pray that those who are compelled to come forward will do so and receive prayer and encouragement. But that all of us, where we are, whether listening in or present, would meet you face to face through prayer. And ask for your strength to do the right thing. We're asking for this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.